first Sunday of Advent, and Alice and I are going to light the candle this morning. Miss Alice, you ready? Let's go to it, young lady. Hear these words from sacred scripture, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. We light this candle as a symbol of Christ our joy. May the joyful promise of your presence, O God, make us rejoice in our hope of salvation. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Would you stand as we sing? who forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. Jesus said, the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor.
most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. we are sorely hindered by our sins, let your bountiful grace and mercy speedily help and deliver us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. be to God.
invite you to stand as we honor the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Would you pray with me? Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts on this joyful day be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. It's been in the news a lot lately that there's a certain movement going on, actually now throughout the world, called the Occupy protest, or the Occupy movement. And something that has not quite been noticed 
in the midst of all of the news stories is that both in London and New York, and I suspect in other places, that some of the leaders of the church have, well, have tried to welcome these young folks into their midst. And it's met with some success, I understand, in some places, and in other places it hasn't gone so well. My understanding is that St. Paul's Cathedral in London actually had to be shut down because of fear of confronting the protesters when they were asked to move so that Sunday services could happen. My understanding is that Trinity Church in New York, one of the oldest Episcopal churches in the country, uh, had some similar troubles when they had to tell the protesters that they would not be allowed to encamp on a certain part of their property that has some graves in it. And that was met with disgust on the part of the protesters as well. Sometimes the ways of the world and the logic of the world clashes with the ways of God and the logic of God. And sometimes those who are in the world demanding something and wanting something and perhaps being blind to what is actually before them have a tendency to miss the point. I'm not going to come down on one side or the other of whether or not the Occupy protesters are right or wrong or whether Jesus would support them or somebody else. I've seen that debate going on on Facebook, and I've said as much that Jesus needs to be able to speak to all of us. I will say this. The world has criticized the church throughout its history for not being aggressive enough in seeking to please the needs of people. We see that in the gospel lesson today, don't we? St. John the Baptist is out there on, in Bethany on the other side of the Jordan baptizing. And the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Levites, send some, some people out there to make an inquiry of John. Who are you? What are you doing? You can almost hear the sneering in their voices. And John simply says, I'm not the Messiah. Well, are you Elijah or, or the prophet? No. No, I'm the one who's crying out like a voice in the wilderness, prepare the way for the king. And they say, well, if you're not who you say you are, or if you're not the Messiah, or you're not this person or that person, then what gives you the right to be baptizing? And John answers by trying to get them to see beyond their own petty concerns. He answers by telling them, I baptize with water, but one is coming after me who is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. And that one is standing here in the midst of you, and it's almost as though John is saying, open your eyes. Look at what the possibilities are. Look at the gift that is about to be offered to you and to all of humankind. Don't miss it because you're focused on your own smallness, the littleness of your question, the littleness of what you're protesting against me about. Because that's what they were doing. They came out there to protest that he was baptizing. They didn't think he was qualified. 
just like those protesters on the steps of St. Paul and in the churchyard of Trinity Church in New York. They're protesting so loudly and so vehemently that they don't even realize they are standing at the very threshold of heaven. God's house. The church. St. Paul has something to say about this. St. Paul has something very profound to say about this. St. Paul, who was persecuting the church, as Saul of Tarsus before the Lord God holded him on the road to Damascus. Isn't it interesting that the epistle lesson this morning is Paul's statement on how we go from blindness to full vision. How we go from can be concerned about our own pettiness to allowing the Lord to open a door for us so that we can experience the joy that he has in mind. Just as Ananias came to visit Paul when Paul was three days blind in Damascus, and just as Ananias prayed over him and laid hands on him in the name of Jesus, and the scales fell from his eyes, and he was no longer blind because he could finally see that Jesus is Lord, so also, as we prepare ourselves, as we quiet ourselves in the advent of the Lord, we need to remember we are standing on the threshold of joy. The very threshold of heaven itself. Think about this. That little holy child of Bethlehem brings heaven to earth. And if we will receive him into our hearts, we will receive the joy that the world cannot take away. And there becomes within us a quietness as we wait for his glorious return. Look with me, if you would, for a moment on page 5, bottom of the page. No, I'm sorry, uh, the bottom of page 6. I was in the right place to begin with. This is Paul's prescription as to how we as Christians need to be standing at the threshold of heaven, beholding the joy of Jesus. He says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. Why? Because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for us. Think on that. If we do those things, if we rejoice always giving thanks, then we're not going to quench the Spirit in verse 19. In verse 20, we're not going to despise the words of the prophets, but we're going to test everything and we're going to hold fast to what is good. In other words, our whole mentality, our whole mentality begins to change. We begin to look at the world around us and instead of seeing grievances, we see the possibilities of what the Lord is doing and can do and will do in our lives. Abstain from every form of evil. We're going to want to. When we begin to unlock that door and when, when the scales begin to fall from our eyes and when we begin to behold the joy of Jesus, we're not going to want to dabble in things that he doesn't want us to dabble in. And then Paul says, may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. May he completely make you holy as he is holy. May his spirit dwell so deeply within you as you quiet yourselves in his presence 
that you begin to look more and more like him each and every day. As you are transformed from one stage of glory to another, may your joy be complete. And may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. May you have no reason as the scales fall from your eyes, as the as the door to the gateway to joy is unlocked, may you have no reason to be ashamed when you stand before Jesus, who is our joy. And then he says in verse 24, the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. Just imagine if those Pharisees and those Levites that confronted John protesting what he was doing, just imagine if they had even a tiny portion of what St. Paul is talking about here in their hearts and in their minds. Imagine their reaction, how it would have been different when John said, the one who's coming after me, who's the thong of whose sandal I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. He's standing here in our midst right now. Imagine what their response would have been if they had been willing to lay aside their pettiness and then look around and start asking, who is this one? I want the joy that he gives. I want the promises that John is proclaiming about him. I want to make way for the king in my life. I want to let him have sway in me and make a difference in me so that I can make a difference in others. But they didn't do that. They fought Jesus every step of the way because they couldn't give up their protest. The words that St. Paul shares with us this morning are literally the key to unlocking what God has for us. This is what the Lord is asking us to do. If we want to see joy, if we want to experience joy, if we want to be filled with joy, then we have to humble ourselves in the presence of the Lord and allow Him to speak and us to be quiet. I'm reminded of a book that I'm reading now for the second time, a book that Emily bought me. I, I tell you, I've been blessed with a wife who anticipates what I might like when it comes to reading. And I never used to read before. She has given me that gift, that, that joy of reading. It's called The Enchanted April. It's the story of four women from London, or just outside of London, who in the dreariness of February and March, with the rain and the wind and the the gray, see an ad in the paper that advertises a castle for rent in Italy, full of flowers and full of sunshine and everything that London is not during the month of April. And they decide, the four of them, to go. They don't know each other. They're perfect strangers at the beginning of this story, although two of them do attend the same church. When they get there, one by one, they begin to see that Providence has landed them in a little bit of heaven. And one by one, they go from guarding themselves and being territorial about, I have this room or I have this garden and nobody else can come here and bother me, 
They go from an attitude of the world to an attitude of Jesus. And they begin sharing. They begin seeing that what is around them is a glimpse of heaven, a glimpse of the joy that is possible in life. And while the author, I don't think, intended it to be a Christian allegory, oh boy, it preaches. It really does. And by the time the story ends, the reader, me in this case, is challenged all over again to open his own eyes and realize that when we stop guarding ourselves, when we stop being territorial, when we stop doing all of these things that protest and just listen to Jesus, we find that we're taken care of in ways that we never would have understood before. We find that there's a joy that bubbles up, a love that spills over. And what we read about in Isaiah this morning, that Hannah read for us so nicely, about everything coming up roses, guess what? It's real. Listen to this. Look at this with me, if you would. The Lord tells us that I'm about to create Jerusalem as a joy, its people as a delight. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it or the cry of distress. No more shall there be an infant that lives but a few days or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. And then this, listen to this. One who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth, and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed. Then he goes on to say that those who build will live in those houses, and those who plant the vineyards will enjoy the produce of those vineyards. They shall not labor in vain, nor shall they bear children for calamity. And then listen to this. As we quiet ourselves in the advent of the Lord, as we glimpse heaven, and joy before they call I will answer while they're yet speaking I will hear the wolf and the lamb shall feed together the lion shall eat straw like an ox they shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain I would that the world would hear this that they would do something other than protest outside the doors of the church, but that they would burst those doors of the church down to want to get at the only thing that will really fill them, the only thing that will bring, bring real joy to their lives. So, beloved, the question for us this morning there's always a question, isn't there? God is always asking something of us. But he's giving twice as much as he asks. The question for us this morning is, has the joy of Jesus invaded our hearts? Is there a smile on our face as we give thanks in all circumstances, not just the good ones? Are we quieting ourselves in the Lord in such a way that come Christmas morning there will be tears of joy coming down our faces as we stand before him and as we declare my Lord and my God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for leading us to the very gate of heaven, to giving us a, for giving us a glimpse into the joy that you have promised, and for sharing with us how you're going to fulfill that promise in our lives. Thank you that 
the circumstances of life cannot get us down if we are in you. Thank you for sharing with us so much more than we can ever possibly understand. We praise you and we give you honor in Jesus' name. invite you to stand as we affirm our faith this morning. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. I invite you to turn with me to page 388 as we continue with the prayers of the people. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles. 
and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, to whom our needs are known before we ask, help us to ask only what accords with your will, and those good things which we dare not or in our blindness cannot ask. Grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us continue worshiping this morning as we receive our tithes and offerings and prepare to come to the Holy Table. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of heaven. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, through your goodness we have this wine to offer, Fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become for us the cup of salvation. Blessed be God forever. Receive, O Lord, these gifts presented by your people for the work of your church. Amen. Let us return our thanks to the Lord, singing, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because you sent your beloved Son to redeem us from sin and death and to make us heirs in him of everlasting life, that when he shall come again in power and great triumph to judge the world, we may without shame or fear rejoice to behold his appearing. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, 
to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him that takes away the sins of the world. Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my soul shall be healed. Beloved, the gifts of God for the people of God. 
Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him joyfully in your hearts with thanksgiving.
invite you to stand as we as we pray our post communion prayer together. Let us pray together. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son, and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. May Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you, scatter the darkness from before your path, and make you ready to meet him when he comes in glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. forth in the name of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. 